Welcome back. This is part two of our series on LED luminaires or LED light fixtures. In the first couple of videos, we discussed the basic properties of light energy and a little of the behavior. In this presentation, we will shift to the specific behavior of light sources. Most, if not all, of this information is empirical or, to say, observable, and you should recognize most of it from your everyday experiences. Now, I'm sure that you all recognize this object, especially if you have ever disassembled a flashlight to replace the bulb. Now, most people don't do that, even back in the days of all incandescent flashlights. Very few people actually replace the bulbs. But anyway, you recognize the face of it. It's a reflector with an incandescent bulb mounted in the middle towards the back. Now this incandescent bulb is mounted in a reflective lens. Normally when you say lens, you tend to think of a glass or plastic circular object that has either concave or convex surface shape to it. I tend to refer to anything that focuses light as a lens, whether it's reflective or refractive. A glass lens works on refraction where a reflector, well, reflect, reflective lens works on reflection. Now the shape of this reflector was calculated to reflect all of the light from the bulb out in front of it in a specific pattern, conical in shape, kind of shape like a bit like a sugar ice cream cone. Notice the texture of the reflective surface. If you are familiar with peening, P-E-E-N-I-N-G, peening, I can imagine that the mold was peened with a ball peen hammer to produce this surface. Nonetheless, it doesn't matter. You look at this reflective surface and you see it's very irregular. So the shape of the reflector is designed to throw all of the light out in front of the reflector, whereas the surface is treated with that irregularity to diffuse or scatter the image of the filament. And this produces a more even illumination of the object that you are focusing the flashlight on. In other words, if you took a mirror and had a incandescent light bulb where the filament, you know, the hot little wire inside the bulb was visible, it would reflect off of the mirror and you would see some representation of the filament out in front of you. So this irregular or rough surface was provided to eliminate the image of the filament and to diffuse or scatter the light in all directions as it's reflected out the front. Now with LEDs, you don't normally have to do that. They have a built-in lens that does the diffusion and then the reflector simply adds to that. Now the undesirable drawback to this rough surface or this irregular surface. It's, the surface is smooth and reflective, but it's not all one even plane or surface, so the light bounces off continually in the correct direction. But the drawback of this, as with any reflector, is you will see a strong illumination approximately in the center of the illuminated area and weaker illumination on the edges because of the scattered light. Now you've all you know, used a flashlight and aimed it at something and you've seen this pattern. Without going into superfluous analysis of the light pattern, in other words, boring you with why there's all those concentric circles and what, what is it about the reflective lens that causes those circles and those different areas, it's sufficient to say here that that bright spot in the middle is the main focus of the design of the lens and all the rest of it is pretty much caused by scattered light or in some cases the reflective lens is designed to give you a nice strong illumination right in the middle and then some light around it so you can see the actual object with a lot of light and then you can kind of see everything else around it to give you a better view. If you're not interested in all this information, no problem. We'll just con you just continue. Don't worry about whether or not you've understood everything you've seen. Now, if you lay a flashlight on its side on a white surface, and I know you've laid a flashlight down 
to do something and seen this pattern or something similar. This really is a further demonstration of what you just saw when you looked at this view. You see in the center there's a bright and then there's variations to the side. And you can see that this is conical in shape. And the point of the cone is at the flashlight filament or bulb. And then the larger diameter circle at the other end of the cone is on the wall. And you can see the side view of the cone here. You can see the strong beam going down the middle. And then you can see the scattered light that goes out in another conical shape. And you see a sub area real close to the lens. So if you look real close, you see uh, some light that goes out broad or wide from the lens. And then you see another cone that fades as it goes out. And then you see a strong one going down the middle. So there's actually three. And I'm assuming that the manufacturer designed the lens that way on purpose. Now, the reason we're going into all of this, you're thinking, what in the world has this got to do with building light planes and using LEDs? I'm trying to move your thinking into a real intimate relationship with light. So when you're looking at light and you're thinking about light and you're designing or building your luminaires, that you're actually thinking about what the light's going to do, not just following steps and, oh, well, it looks like it worked out pretty good. This is a side view of the cone of emission. So if you look there and then here, this is a better side view. You can see the flashlight aperture and it probably has glass across the front of it. That's just to protect the bulb and keep dirt out of it. Then you see the kind of the broad dispersion right away and then a little heavier one and then a real heavy one going right down the middle. Most of the weaker areas of illumination are photons of light that have been scattered off of the reflective surface or by the lens that's on the LED because the LEDs themselves have a lens, a little plastic molded lens, or the glass on the that's protecting and keeping dirt out of the flashlight scatters some. The center beam that you see here is the direct light or photons of light that leave the source and have yet to be impeded or interfered with. Since we are moving towards building light planes with LEDs as the light source, let's get down to business with LEDs. Okay, these are tres amigos, el rojo, la verde y la azul. Don't be offended by my uh, less than optimum Spanish, because I just abuse the gender of the articles of the language. However, let's get on here. But here we have three LEDs in a dark room. So you're standing in a dark room. You're looking at three LEDs. Now, if you're seeing them this large, then you're standing pretty close. They are not looking at you, but they are emitting electromagnetic radiation in the visible light range or spectrum towards you. There are literally three spots of light on the retinas of both of your eyes. However, we are not that interested in observing the direct light from these three light sources. Let's add a top view of the cones of emission from these three LEDs. So, el rojo, la verde, y la azul. Mr. Red, Miss Green, and Miss Blue. Here's our three LEDs. Now, I've truncated means I've cut off the cone of emission so you can't see it as it continues towards the top of the screen. I, I purposely truncated them so I could add a dash line to represent a surface that the propagating cones of emission would reflect off of and then provide the view that the LEDs would have of the surface. So we have, we really have Three views here. The bottom three spots, red, green, blue LEDs, as you look at them directly at the LEDs. Then if you stand to the side or above or below and look up at the three LEDs, you see the three cones of emission. Now, if the, if the air in the room is really clear and clean, you won't see anything. But the light is propagating out in front of them in a conical shape. Whether or not you can actually see the cone 
Now, y'all know if you had smoke in the room or a fog machine, well, this would all show up. We're after the behavior of light here, so we have to show you this. Then the dashed line represents the wall that the three LEDs are illuminating. And then just above that, you have three larger spots. Because as these cones propagate out, they're diverging. Therefore, the circle is getting bigger. Now, it would also get dimmer. And I, it didn't occur to me to make these three dots or the three spots a little dimmer just to be more realistic. But you know as the light spreads out, it gets weaker because you've spread it out over more space. You notice that the diameter or width of the circles are the same width of the beams when they reach the wall, the dashed line. So if, if you were to drop those circles down, you would find they are exactly the same width the beam was when it struck the wall. So we're trying to keep a uh, proper ratio here. So what happens if we move further back from the wall? Okay, you think about that a minute. You already know what the answer is. Picture it in your mind though. What do the round spots, the planes? So at this point, those three big spots, the red, green, and the blue circles, the big ones, those are light planes. They are a flat surface that is lit. They're a light plane. And we'll try to keep referring to that terminology to get you used to it. But what happens if you move further back? Well, if you move further back from the wall, notice that the cones of emission are now coming closer together. I didn't make the cones any bigger. I just moved further back with the LEDs from the wall. So the result then is going to be that the three spots become larger as you move further back from the wall. So the LED cones of emission are diverging to a wider spot. And of course, those three spots would get dimmer. And that is just a standard behavior of light that I think you're already well familiar with. Now, what would happen if we moved even further away from the wall with your red, green, and blue light sources? So think about the minute. You already know the answer part of it. They're going to get bigger, right? Well, not only are they going to get bigger, they're going to overlap. So here you see the red and the green overlap to give you yellow. The green and the blue overlap to give you cyan. Graphically, the software that I was using to create these graphic objects, I couldn't create an ellipse with points on the end to create a perfect appearance of the red and green overlapping and the red and the I mean the green and the blue overlapping. But you get the general idea. The circles start to cross over in the area on the wall where red and green hits. It's going to mix those together, reflect it back to your eye, and you're going to see yellow. If you look where the green and the blue are overlapping, you're going to see cyan. I only have three here, and I can't show you red and blue in this graphic what happens where they overlap. But let's say uh, that we were to swap the or just remove the green and, and move the blue over till it overlaps with the red. You see what would happen. Where the red and the blue overlap, you now get magenta. I think you you're realizing now that to get more than red, green, and blue, you you need to mix the light on a surface or rather reflect the primary colors off of the same surface in the same spot so that the photons, the different photons, that is the different wavelengths, mix together and give you the different colors that you want. So to create a light plane that is of a color of your choosing, you're going to have to pick percentages, combinations of red, green, and blue to get those colors. Now, we already mentioned there were 16,777,000 blah, blah, blah different colors that you could get if you can increment or decrement these three colors from 0 to 255. In other words, you turn the knob and it goes from 0 to 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, all the way up to 255. That gives you 0 through 255 different settings for each of the three colors. By manipulating those three 8-bit color controls, you can get 16,777,000 plus different colors. 
you, I think you're catching on here. So now let's go to the to the big show. And here's what, in other words, what if we were to focus the three colors all in one spot? Well, actually, we have three spots here. We have a red, green, and a blue spot, but they overlap. And that's the idea of this graphic is for you to see this. Let me back up to this one or even further back to this. Okay, you're looking at these three spots. Think about this. On the back of your retina, the back of your eyeball, inside your eyeball, on the back, the retina, has 7 million cones. These cones are sensors that are sensitive to color and intensity. Also, you have 75 to 150 million rods that are more sensitive to intensity. Your eye produces this image to your brain that includes the black screen. So whatever you're looking at, whatever you can see, including the bezel around your monitor, this is an image that is focused on the back of your eye. That red, green, and blue dot there, they right now are on your retina. If you could look inside and look at your retina, you'd see a red, a green, and a blue dot. And now, if you were just looking at the upper three, there would be bigger red, green, and blue dots on the back of your eye, on the retina, creating a, a, a kind of a pixel image of intensities and color going to your brain, and then your brain's interpreting it. Now, there's some other details here to do with reversal of images that go through a lens and how your brain handles that. We're not into that in this lecture, but that is interesting. So we'll move back to where we were at, right here. So we take our red, green, and blue LEDs and we move them into a circle, but pointing downwards so we can create three spots, one red, one green, and one blue. Well, this is the big picture right here, folks, or the, or the, or the big show, where the red and the green are both striking the surface, you're gonna see yellow. Where blue and red are both on the same surface, you're going to see magenta. Where green and blue are both illuminating the surface, scattering the light, diffusing it, you're going to see cyan. What this doesn't show you is the gradations of color changing from red to green. You just see yellow. But actually, it goes red, orange, less orange, more yellow, 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 green, and then green. So you don't see those variations here. So let's go to the, the really big picture, and uh, this isn't a perfect graphic, but you can see the center is white, because remember, where you have red, green, and blue in the right proportion, you have white. When you add the colors together, you get more light, and sunlight is made up of the entire spectrum. Now, we do differentiate between white and sunlight, because sunlight is a spe very specific spectrum whereas white reflects most light, but no white is pure white. If you were to take the whitest white of three different paint manufacturers, paint three surfaces, and put them all together so they kind of uh, were like, you know, the shape of a circle, and each one was a one-third pie. In other words, you cut the pie into three pieces, and you stood back and looked at it, you'd say, oh no, this, this one's not white. It's it's gray, or this one's light blue. When you start putting whites together, one of them's going to be more white than the rest of them, and it's going to make the rest of them look like they're not white because the impurities are going to show up. So no white is perfect white. Always keep that in mind. White is one thing. Sunlight is something different. Matter of fact, sunlight is a little warmer than a lot of the whites that are used for fluorescent fixtures. They are cool white, meaning that they have more blue and less yellow. Or you should, I could say there's more blue and less red and green. So you get more of a bluish white. I will talk more about that later. Uh, this was the really big show. So now let's, let's move on. Okay, let's talk more about diffusion. Because this is what you, you need to take advantage of this behavior in order to produce a really good LED luminaire. Now, if you just want to see the LEDs, you know, the little colored dots, red, green, and blue. And there are some LEDs that have their LED devices, but they're not LEDs. 
their devices because inside the device are three or four LEDs, red, green, and blue, and sometimes a white LED. So if you stand back at any distance, the LED, you perceive it as one single color. And then when you get real close, you see that it's not. There's some red, there's some green, there's some blue, and maybe some white. Uh, those of you that have any have a few years under your belt, remember the old color TVs that had a cathode ray tube. A cathode, cathode ray tube is a real big molded glass evacuated. In other words, they suck all the air out of it, and inside of it is a whole bunch of really cool equipment that controls an electron beam that is aimed towards the front, is pulled towards the front by a high positive voltage. And the old color TVs, the high voltage that was applied to the front of the tube to pull the electron beam was 25, 30,000 volts, and it could kill you. You could put your hand in the back of an old color TV and not live to regret it. That cathode ray tube, if you were to look at the front of it, you would closely, or you put a drop of water on it to form a small magnifying lens, you could very easily see that when you had a white screen, that what you actually had were millions of red, green, and blue dots. And there was a time when I could remember the exact proportion of how much red, how much blue, and how much green you needed to get white, you know, perfect white. And if you remember the old color TVs, you could adjust them to get black and white. But if you looked at the white or the grays, you would see it was made up of red, green, and blue dots. If you look at an LED screen right now, if that's what you have in front of you, if you look at it with a magnifying glass, you may be able to see the red, green, and blue dots that make up any white areas on the screen. Or look at uh, the red lipstick on somebody on the screen, or something red, and you're going to see just red dots. If you look at offset printing, where offset printing is done by printing microscopic dots of ink of primary colors, including black, so you get good contrast. That is exactly how a color TV worked. That's how your LED screen works. So, enough of that. Okay, so diffusion. We're after diffusion. Looking at that previous image, the only reason that you can see yellow or orange where the primary colors red and green overlap is because of a behavior termed diffusion or scattering. Let's consider, consider diffusion for a few minutes or so. This, we're, we're going to step out of the dark, okay? You're probably getting tired of, you know, walking around standing in a dark room. So let's get you out in the sunlight. And we have a white surface exposed to direct sunlight. Direct as in no clouds, no fog, no haze to scatter the direct light from the sunlight. One of those days when the sky is really, really dark blue. And of course, if you understand light, you realize that the blue sky is caused by the sunlight having the blue in it scattered. And so when you look up at the sky at any part of it, it all looks blue. That's because what you're seeing is blue wavelengths from the sunlight that's been scattered. So if you take out the blue out of sunlight, then you get a more orange or yellowish sun. If you didn't have the blue sky, in other words, if you were in outer space where it was black because there's no atmosphere to diffuse or scatter the light energy, the sun will look more white hot instead of orangey, fiery yellow, red. Now, when the sunlight strikes the surface with the entire visible spectrum, electromagnetic energy, the molecular makeup of the surface reflects all or most of the spectrum off into space at many angles of, from the surface. The scattering of light is called diffusion. You would not be able to see that white surface unless the sunlight that struck it was also reflected in your direction. But if you thought of that rectangle as a mirror, then you would have to be standing on the exact opposite side of the mirror to see the sun reflecting off of it into your eye. So you understand that in order to diffuse the light, the surface has to be have texture to it. It can't be perfectly smooth. Otherwise, you have a glare. So you know the difference between a glare and 
no glare. You notice that a vehicle hood, a car hood, truck hood, if it's shiny and waxed, has a real strong glare off of it, but if it's dull and oxidized, the glare's not as strong, but you see the oxide all over the hood because it's scattering the light to your eye. So once again, if there is no light reflecting off of the object into your eye, you will not see it. You cannot see the object unless light is reflecting off of it into your eye. Now, it is worth mentioning that we did not label the reflected light as sunlight because some of it was absorbed by that surface and converted to heat, and then some was re-radiated as infrared electromagnetic energy. Now, how do we know this? Well, lay a white surface outside in the sunlight and a black one as well. Now, as you can come up with if you're really interested, you could come up with something black, something white that's made out of the same material, like a black pop can. I mean a pop can. You could paint one white, one black, and set them out in the sun. The black one will heat up fairly quickly because it is absorbing all of the light energy and converting most of that into heat energy and re-radiating quite a bit of it, most of it. Eventually, the white surface will warm up a little proving that some of the sunlight was absorbed and converted to heat. If you could place your hand near the black surface but not above it, in other words, you don't want to feel the heat that's convecting, the hot air that's rising off the black surface, but if you could put your hand near the black surface, not right above it, you would feel heat radiating. So there are two forms of heat, if you want to say, coming off that black object. One, the surface, the black surface, heats up the air molecules. They get excited, they expand, and off they go up. And when they go up, if you have your hand there, the warm air hits your hand. But there is also radiation coming off of that surface. If you put your hand above it, you're going to feel the heat from convection. You, you're feeling the radiation, but you, at that point you, can tell, you can't tell which is which. But if you take any hot object and put your hand to the side of it, for instance... A campfire. Now, if, if you're a city person, maybe you've never experienced a fireplace or a campfire. If you've ever been outside where there's a campfire or a burning barrel and it's freezing cold outside, zero degrees Fahrenheit, which would be, I don't know, minus seven, eight, nine, whatever centigrade, it's cold. If there's a fire, you can feel heat coming from the fire. The heat that you feel when you stand to the side of the fire, away from it, that's pure radiation. That's not hot air. And the way you can prove this, and of course you're not really going to do this, but you're going to have to picture this in your head. Let's say you were standing outside with your boots and socks on in your underwear. Okay, now don't be picturing someone else doing this. Picture yourself doing this. If there was a campfire there, one side of you would be warm the side facing the campfire, the other side's cold. What does that tell you? The air is cold, period. The air temperature all around your body is zero degrees. But one side of your body is receiving radiant energy from the fire. And if you were to stand with four or five campfires around you, in other words, you stood in the middle, and then five feet away in all directions was a ring of fire, you could stand there, you know, naked, and you'd be perfectly comfortable temperature-wise because the mean radiant temperature is more important than the actual air temperature. And I could go on and on about this, but I'm going to drop it. So I'm trying to get you really thinking about electromagnetic energy. That heat that you get off of the uh, hot surface as radiation, that is electromagnetic radiation in the infrared range that we showed in the spectrum in an earlier slide. That was a white surface. Uh, by the way, you also notice that really good diffusion, a good, ex a good illustration, is on a, a really cloudy, overcast day. If you go outside, there's no shadows. You need direct light to produce a shadow. If the light is coming all around you, then there's no shadow. And when you go out and stand outside on a cloudy day, there's no shadow. When the sun comes out, then you're going to have a shadow. Okay, that was a white surface. What if we had a red surface? When the sunlight reaches the red surface, what do you think is going to happen? 
I'll give you a second to think about it. It's a red surface. It's painted red. The green and the blue are going to be absorbed, the red reflected, and then the green and blue wavelengths, they were converted to heat, and then the heat radiates infrared off. So coming off of this surface, your eye sees the red, but there is also infrared coming off of it. Now I show the red reflected off with an arrow, but really that red is reflected off in all directions from the surface. Just like you were to lay that surface flat and then take and make a great big round sphere, cut it in half and set it over the top of that red rectangle there, red would hit almost every square inch of the inside of that hemisphere, that half sphere. So the red reflects off in all directions. Now if you take a red object that's flat and go out in the sun or even with artificial light right in your room where you're sitting and you start lowering your point of view until you're almost looking across the top of the surface, you will see it gets darker and darker. There's more red reflected straight out and then less and less as you go around the sides. The point is that's diffuse. It started out as direct light. Then we experience something called selective reflection. So that red pigment, whatever that chemical compound is, those atoms and molecules, they are of such a concoction that they reflect red. They selectively select reflect red. Therefore, the green and the blue are absorbed, converted into heat, and then re-radiated as infrared. Now, that's a red surface. What if we had a green surface? And we have sunlight come down with a full spectrum, red, green, and blue. What do you think is going to happen? The green is going to reflect off. The red and the blue are going to convert to heat because they're absorbed and they excite the molecules in the surface. And then the molecules, as the electrons pop in and out, they give off a characteristic, if you like, wavelength that's infrared. Now this is invisible infrared, not visible infrared. You can't see this. And if you say, well, you can see it waving on the surface. No, that's hot air rising, disturbing the air above it. Like when you're out in the desert, you look off in the distance and you see what they call a mirage or you see heat waves. That's air that's been disturbed by the motion of convection. Those aren't heat waves. That's disturbed air. Those are convection waves. Okay, so you get the idea here. Red surface reflects red, absorbs the other two, makes heat. Green surface reflects green, absorbs red and blue, converts to heat, and then infrared comes off. Okay, let's do a blue surface. When the sunlight reaches the blue surface, what's going to happen? Well, you should already be able to answer this. Blue gets reflected, red, green, absorbed, converted to heat, re-radiated as infrared. Now, we did white, we did red, we did green, we did blue. Let's go to the other extreme. In other words, white reflects all the color, then blue reflects blue, red reflects red, green reflects green. What happens if we go to a black surface? Now, you should know enough by now to be able to uh, think for a second or two and then just spit this right out. So what happens when the sunlight reaches the black surface? Let's see. Red, green, and blue are absorbed, converted to heat, re-radiated as infrared. Nothing is reflected off. This is absorption. You're looking at a solar panel, and that's pretty much what solar panels do, except the infrared, we don't let it just re-radiate out into space. We put glass, you know, three to eight inches above this black surface, and then we use a blower, you know, a fan, centrifugal blower, to pull air across the top of this black panel. So we are pulling the heat off of the panel and into the house as fast as it's being converted from sunlight into heat. Now, it's important to say here that this black surface, if it were extremely shiny, you know, smooth, glossy, 
you would not get really good absorption. You would get some, but you wouldn't, it wouldn't be as efficient of a solar panel. You want texture on the surface. That's why you use flat black. And the difference between flat black and shiny black is the surface texture. Not, not to wax technical on you here, but there's something called dendritic depositions, which is a surface treatment that gives a real uh, like crystal sharp edge shape microscopically to the surface. And so it mechanically traps all the light. In other words, the light comes in there, it gets in between these pieces and it bounces around a couple times. And every time the light re-strikes something physical, more is absorbed. A matte black coating absorbs more sunlight than a shiny black coating. Uh, enough to make it worthwhile to make it flat black instead of shiny black. Okay, let's go back into the dark room. We're going to do a little bit more here. Imagine at the top of this dark room are two skylights. Totally transparent apertures that allow only direct sunlight to enter the room. Not scattered. So you're not getting any blue from the atmosphere. You're just getting direct sunlight. However, the room is entirely coated internally with a matte finished black coating. This would absorb all the light entering the windows that are mounted up in the ceiling. And without any other objects in the room, you would see nothing. Okay, you're standing in a pitch black room, but there are two transparent openings in the ceiling that are allowing direct sunlight to come in. Now, if you walked over and placed your hand so it was in direct light of that, in the direct position to receive the direct light, as you moved your hand in, you would see first your fingertips, and that's all you'd see in the whole room, nothing but your fingertips because there's no light bouncing around to reflect off of you and the rest of your hand. Again, I'm trying to get you into thinking about how light behaves. In this case, there are two objects in the room. So let's say that we had the, those two apertures closed. We open them, and when the direct sunlight comes in, they, are, they become visible. In other words, they become illuminated. The plane on the left, that's the black one, has the outside of the frame visible, but the plane itself is without reflection of light to your eye. If it's black, there's no light reflecting to your eye. What you cannot determine, though, is whether the plane is transparent or a mirror, or just a surface that's painted perfectly absorbing black. If it is transparent, then all of the light passing through is passing through it and none is reflected or if it's a black surface all the electromagnetic energy of the light is absorbed and converted to heat and any re-radiation or infrared is invisible to the eye. The, the other choice that it's a mirror. If it were a mirror and it, if it was level the floor and facing basically perpendicular to the window above the sunlight would come in and go right back out. It would reflect off the mirror and go back out. If the sunlight came in and struck the mirror at an angle, then the sunlight would reflect off and onto a wall opposite the angle of the mirror. Remember, if the room is totally black and absorbing, the sunlight reflects off the mirror and then is absorbed in the wall. You still wouldn't see it. Now, the other uh, plane there, light plane, the plane of Light to the right is obviously a white surface capable of scattering the light and scattering it to all positions around and above the plane, visible to all who have a direct line of sight to the front surface of that object, the plane. Now, we don't care about the mirror or black surface, so we will lose it. We'll pull it out of our illustration and focus on surface diffusing, diffusion, the surface diffuser is that's going to be one of your primary components of your LED luminaire is a surface diffuser. When light is scattered from a surface, we have coined that as surface diffusion. And from now on, we'll refer to that as a surface diffuser or surface diffusion. Before we end this session, I'm going to throw in a little video clip of a a little demonstration I did with a flashlight and a mirror, I would like to have inserted it 
a couple of minutes earlier than I am right now. Nonetheless, you'll see the demonstration. It'll make sense. Okay, we have a mirror laying on the table. We have a flashlight that's focused into a small spot as we can for the quality of the flashlight that we have. Notice the spot of light on the table when we move over the mirror you see the blue plastic on the mirror but as we keep going you see that there's no light spot in the middle of the mirror. You see the light spot there you don't see the light spot there. That's because this is direct reflection this is diffuse or diffuse reflection. In this case the direct light from the flashlight beam is reflected off of the mirror off into space. In this case on the tabletop because the surface has a diffuse texture meaning it's an irregular texture it scatters the light in all directions some of which reaches your eye but most of it actually does go off into space the same as it does with direct. For our project we want diffuse light, not direct light. We're going to stop right here. We went a little longer than we wanted. We got to about 40 minutes plus. Thank you for watching part two, an introduction to the behavior of light energy. Part two of LED luminaires light planes, which is an introduction to the behavior of light energy. So next you want to watch LED luminaires, light planes, part two, an introduction to the behavior of light energy continued. So this will, the next video will be the second half of part two.